All right, guys, what's up? Uh, this is going to be kind of like the wrap-up lecture uh, for the introduction to uh, to civil liberties. I know that kind of sounds weird, the wrap-up lecture to uh, to the introductory lecture. However, uh, this is just us finishing up what we were not able to finish in the class. And this is right around where we ended, so let's get cranking. So we talked about some selecti selective incorporation. So uh, selective incorporation, uh, if you guys can kind of remember uh, through the uh, from the lecture earlier today, um, this is this judicial doctrine where not all but some of the Bill of Rights are going to be made applicable to the to the states through the 14th Amendment. And I want to talk about one particular court case um, called Palco versus Connecticut. So this court case, you do not need to write this stuff down. Um, if you need to write it down, I will let you know. So Palco versus Connecticut, crazy case. So Palco, let's just kind of read through some of these points. Palco is going to be charged with murder, first degree, and uh, goes to the court case. He is found guilty, not of first degree, but actually of second degree murder, and then he's going to be sentenced to life. So not to get into the details, but uh, usually first degree is premeditated, meaning that you thought about it, you planned it, and you want to kill somebody. Second degree, you know what? You killed the person. However, you it may have not been pre-planned, premeditated. But uh, So he's going to be found guilty of second degree murder, but not first degree murder. Well, Connecticut's going to go, what the heck, man? What? Second degree? No, this should be first degree. Uh, anyway, so Palco is going to be retried. Wait a second. You guys should think about this. Retry doesn't the particular amendment say that you can't do this? Something called double jeopardy? Well, yes, but uh, Palco is going to be retried uh, anyways. So Palco is retried and he's found guilty, not of second degree of murder, but now of first degree murder and he is sentenced to death. Palco is going to appeal and he's going to say, Whoa, 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 double jeopardy, double jeopardy, something's going on. So uh, he says that uh, this is this violates double jeopardy, and you know what? I had the Fifth Amendment right that says that, hey, I cannot be tried for the same crime twice, um, and that's, of course, with the same evidence, so on and so forth. Now, he's going to claim that if you look at the title of his court case, Paco versus Connecticut, he's going to claim that because of the due process clause in the 14th Amendment and selective incorporation, that double jeopardy should apply to this case, to where double jeopardy should apply to the states. However, the Supreme Court is going to say no. So the Supreme Court is going to allow this double jeopardy. So the Supreme Court upholds Palco's second conviction and death sentence. And why does the Supreme Court do this? Well, the Supreme Court is going to say that, look, the Fifth Amendment's double jeopardy, that's not a fundamental freedom. So this idea of fundament, fundamental freedoms are going to pop up. So kind of crazy. So fundamental freedoms, let's write this down. Let's write um, just the first point down. It's totally fine. So the fun, uh, we, the reason why I said the first point is because we're going to even we're gonna revisit this topic where you're going to have to know all this stuff, but just for the sake of this online lecture, and I'm trying to get through this quick, let's do just the first point. So fundamental freedoms are those rights that are defined by the court to be essential. So these are essential to order, uh, for liberty, and for justice. So these fundamental freedoms, these are the ones that you're going to see that will be um, incorporated. Uh, so that selective incorporation idea. These particular fundamental freedoms are the one, the ones that we quote unquote select, or I, don't, I should say we, but the government, the Supreme Court is going to select to incorporate uh, based on precedent and by by way of means of certain cases that they have that they have tried in the past. So uh, fundamental freedoms. We'll get more to that. There is a uh, scrutiny review uh, that uh, that we'll talk about. Kind of a little bit confusing. Um, Believe it or not, there's actually not just one way to review whether or not the Equal Protection Laws in the 14th Amendment has been violated. There's different steps and different rationalities. Uh, like the slide says, we're going to discuss this in greater detail later. So for the sake of moving on, let's move on. So we'll talk about this later. Um, now, most of the amendments in the Bill of Rights have been incorporated, but there are some that have not. The Second Amendment has not. The Third Amendment, well, that's... There's really no even reason for the Third Amendment in 2015, so that has not. Um, one part of the Fifth Amendment has not been incorporated, and that's the uh, the uh, the grand jury indictment piece. Um, 
civil jury trial as well as the Eighth Amendment, um, or I should say part of the Eighth Amendment. So no excessive fines or bail. The reason for that is because um, there's going to be different laws per state. Um, so these are some of the ones that have not been incorporated. So sometimes it's easier to think which ones have not been incorporated rather than which ones have in fact been incorporated. Um, and if I were you, I would, I would, I would know these, um, know which ones um, have been incorporated and have not been incorporated. So let's move on to the First Amendment. So you guys know the First Amendment very well. Really quick, just know that uh, in regards to religion, freedom of religion, there are two parts. Uh, and we've, like I said, discussed this multiple times. You have the Establishment Clause, Exercise Clause. Uh, the Establishment Clause says that a government institution cannot establish a national religion. So Mr. Porcho cannot say, students, let's pray right now. Let's pray that you guys do awesome on the Unified Test. That's illegal. I cannot do that based on the freedom of religion. That's me establishing a religion inside class. Um, the other clause of the First Amendment, freedom of religion, is, is the exercise clause. And the government cannot interfere with the citizen's right to practice his or her religion. So I cannot say, say sorry, Johnny, uh, you should not practice Christianity. You should not practice uh, Islam because um, blah, 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 blah. I, I can't say that. that that's... Um, it's going against the exercise clause. Um, in regards to the First Amendment, in with within regards to speech and press, uh, there's something that we call prior restraint. So this is the uh, the constitutional doctrine, and I would write this down. Um, I would write down uh, this whole first point here, for sure. Um, if you want to use an example, awesome. Prior restraint means that um, the government cannot prevent. Uh, something from being said or publicized before the fact. So the government uh, maybe has prior knowledge um, that maybe some papers are going to be released and they cannot say, the government cannot ex nay on that. They cannot uh, try to prevent that from happening. Um, a great example of this is the Pentagon Papers. Remember Vietnam War, Pentagon, the Pentagon Papers they're going to say how, you, you know what, yeah, uh, LBJ did some not uh, ethical things. Remember that Gulf of Tonkin resolution? Yeah, uh, oops, um, yeah. LBJ kind of little did a little fib on that. So um, th when the government knew about this, they, they could not prevent this from happening. So that's... Um, something in regards to prior restraint. So this is that the Supreme Court ruled that the U.S. government could not block the publication of uh, those secret Depart Department of Defense documents illegally furnished by the Times. Now, they were illegally furnished. However, that still does not allow the, the U.S. government to uh, block the publication of those. So that's prior restraint. So that's something the government cannot do. Now we're starting to see a lot of the limitations that, we, that, uh, that are on the government. And we're going to see some... Um, restraints that are also on, um, or limitations that are on um, the people as well. And some of those include two things, the clear and present danger test, which you guys should know from the Shank versus U.S. case, as well as the direct incitement test, which I'm not sure if you've heard of yet. But uh, the clear and present danger test, uh, this basically just states that, look, you cannot say it if uh, whatever you say is uh, that it is clear and present that there's going to be some type of danger. So um, in regards to the Shank versus U.S., uh, this dude Shank is he's uh, passing out all these leaflets that are going all about socialism and socialism's awesome. Socialism's awesome. Well, guess what? Uh, yeah, that's gonna be a problem because uh, this is um, during World War One that he's doing this. Now the case is in 1919, so that's after World War One. But this is during World War One, during war. How dangerous can that be? So um, they will say that these anti-war leaflets that it's okay during peace. However. They're not going to be permissible during war because this is too dangerous. It, present, it presents a clear and present danger um, because of the war that's going on. Now, the direct incitement test is a little bit different. This is um, dealing with the case in particular of Brandenburg versus Ohio. And this is going to say, look, um, you cannot say that you're going to do something or that, excuse me, that you can say that you're going to do something illegal. However... Um, if there's something that is, if it's an imminent lawless action, meaning that, that if it's definite that you're going to be doing something that's lawless, that's illegal, um, and that, that you're intending to do this, 
thing that's imminent, then that's a problem. I know that's a little confusing and that's very wordy what I just said, but for instance, this is going to work. This is where the, a, a great example of this is I'm going to kill all white people. That's direct incitement. So is that illegal to kill all white people? Absolutely. Um, is that an imminent lawless action? Absolutely. Is this okay? No, it's not. So this is not okay based on the direct incitement test. All right, so let's move on. You don't need to write all this stuff on here, but just kind of know, know the basics um, of what each one of each one says. I, I would definitely um, not be surprised if I saw both of these on the test for the, the national government test. All right, let's talk about symbolic speech. You guys know Texas v. Johnson. Texas v. Johnson uh, said that uh, burning the American flag is okay. That is a it is a symbol of expression, uh, even though it's a symbol of opposition in the United States. It is okay. Um, so just write this first bullet point down. These are some good examples. So this is defined as symbols, signs, and other methods of expression that are generally considered to be protected. So symbolic speech is protected uh, in the First Amendment. And two good examples of this are that I just said talk, Texas versus Johnson and Tinker versus Des Moines. Remember that was the court case that upheld that. Um, wearing those black armbands uh, to protest the Vietnam War or Vietnam War uh, was permissible. That was good. That, or not, I shouldn't say good necessarily, but that was um, upheld um, by, the, by the First Amendment. All right. Another uh, form of symbolic speech would be burning the cross. So in the picture here, you see the KKK burning the cross. And a lot of students might think, wait a second, poor show. Why would the KKK, who proclaim to be Protestant, be burning a cross? Well, the idea is they're not saying that something is bad about religion. They're not saying something is bad about Christianity. But this is going to be a practice that many people have done, I think even starting in the 1800s. And, and when people burn crosses, what they're saying is that we're getting ready for war. It's kind of like the, a... Uh, a um, pronouncement of, all right, let's do this. We're going to get ready for war and we're calling people to action. Well, um, this does have a racial intimidation idea behind it for sure, because of course this happened, this, who did this? The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. And these people were absolutely racist, trying to intimidate um, uh, blacks. Uh, remember, I mean, you can think about the horrible stuff they did, like lynchings. And they, I mean, I, we can go on and on about the KKK and what they did, but um, there's going to be a court case that's going to say, you know what, burning the cross is okay. And check this out. Th there's going to be a court case that says burning the cross, or excuse me, that a white teen burning a cross in a black family's front lawn is okay. Craziness. Absolute craziness, but this is the First Amendment. This is symbolic speech. However, they're going to kind of go against this a little bit. I would say write down this bold right here. First Amendment prevents governments from silencing speech on basis of its content. So its content is important as well. However, we're going to redefine this a little bit, or refine it, excuse me, and say, you know what? This is not going to be okay. Bur you know, having a burning a cross on a black family's front lawn is not going to be okay. Because it's apparent that there's that there is some type of intent of racial intimidation there. So let's just say, and this, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but you're going to burn a cross just for the heck of it and you don't mean anything racial by it, then that is legally allowed. However, if you do mean intent, if you do intend to racial to racially discriminate against somebody, then that's not okay. Now that's up for the courts to decide in their interpretation of what's going on. All right, let's move on here. We're getting to the end here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip this. This is an event that happened a couple years ago, but uh, not important for the AP test, so we're going to go through this. Uh, free, speech, free speech zones, kind of something similar. When you guys go to college, you guys might see this in college. I know um, there were um, instances when I, when I was at Cal State Fullerton that they did this, but a lot of colleges will, um, they're going to ban um, forms of speeches. Um, However, a lot of other schools are going to create these free speech zones where going to um, where they're going to allow free speech um, in a restricted time, and you're going to see a lot of like uh, signs. A lot of this has to do with um, a, a lot of these free speech zones. You don't have to write anything down, but a lot of these speech zones have to deal with like war, and some of them can actually appear like they're trying to provoke violence but that may not be the case but um the the idea with this is kind of weird that free speech is allowed in some parts of the university 
but it's limited in other parts. So this is just kind of an idea not going to be on the AP test, but um, I, I would doubt I would be surprised to see it on the AP test, but something that is uh, that definitely is evident and it's applicable to you guys as uh, seen as high school students that are going to college next year. So what's not protected under free speech? We went over some of these things um, like burning the cross, if you're going to racially discriminate against somebody or um, if you want to, if you're going to um, present clear and present danger, or maybe you're want to, going to say you're going to kill all white skinny dudes. But um, some of the other things that are not protected, I would say put all of these, write down all of these. Uh, libel, which is, um, which is just uh, false statements that are written. Slander, which are false spoken statements. If you want a way to remember the difference between libel and slander, slander starts with an S. Well, so is spoken, so therefore, <coughs> excuse me, slander is false spoken statements. Um, I don't know. I try to come up with an example. Um, Mr. Porsche was Mexican. I just said, right? That's a false spoken statement. Um, now, if I somebody were write that Mr. Porsche actually physically write it as Mexican, that would be liable. Now, that doesn't really make sense because that's not. There's no harmful intent with that. But that's just a, kind of a stupid example. But fighting words uh, also are not protected under the freedom of speech or free speech. So these are words that by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of peace. Um, so if you're if you're looking to cause something, that's going to be like a fighting word. Obscenity, you guys know this, Miller versus California. That was the case uh, where the dude decided, oh, I have a really good idea. I'm going to mail porn to particular restaurants. So um, that's... You, that's not protected under free speech and lewdness. So uh, a good example of lewdness is um, like sexual harassment. All right, so let's move on. Let's go into the Second Amendment. You guys know the Second Amendment. We're going to skip this. You guys know this well. You guys are amazing at the Second Amendment. Uh, now let's move on to the Fourth Amendment. And I want to kind of camp out here for a little bit. Fourth Amendment. Um, you guys know the Fourth Amendment. So you must um, have a search warrant to search one's um home or place of residence. So um, over the years, the court is going to interpret the Fourth Amendment to mean a couple of things. So the police, um, can they search Can they search you when you're arrested? Yes, they can. Um, now you can you can try to um, ask the police, you know, for probable cause and stuff, and will they give it to you? Sure. But um, if you're arrested, you will get searched. Uh, number two, uh, if things are in plain view of the accused person, then that um, the police can search that. For instance, let's say... Um, let's say you're, uh, I don't know, so, stupid example. Let's say the police find somebody that's smoking weed on their front porch and, um, the police come up there. Well, that's in plain view, right? They can see the bag of weed on the porch, so they don't need a search warrant for that. It's right there. They can see it. That's in plain view. Um, so for number three, um, the the Fourth Amendment has allowed the police to search places or things that the arrested person can also touch or reach or otherwise in the arrestee's immediate control. So that's just another form of uh, those things that might be in plain view, but um, might be things that they have uh, that the person that's accused uh, can easily assess. Now, there's a very important rule within the Fourth Amendment, and this is really going to be uh, kind of... Kind of deal with that court case called Matt versus Ohio, which we've studied a little bit in class. But and this is going to deal with what's called the exclusionary rule, meaning that if it's not on the warrant, the search warrant, or in the search warrant, then it's inadmissible in the courtroom. So inadmissible means that you don't that um, it it was it was somehow illegally obtained. So that evidence does not have to be used in the courtroom or maybe should not be used in the courtroom because it was attained legally. Now, this is up to the judge. The, to ju the judge uh, could decide whether it's admissible, meaning that that evidence is good to use in the court, or inadmissible, meaning that, you know what, uh, sorry, we, that, that piece of evidence should not be used uh, in the courtroom. So, all right, guys, so last slide here for today, the exclusionary rule, a little bit more about this, but uh, let's go through here. I would say write down... Write down this slide right here, or excuse me, that bullet point, that um, this last one, inevitable discovery. So um, this is going more along with what with what we were talking about here. Make sure you write the exclusionary rule down as well. But um, so there are good faith exceptions to this, guys. 
Uh, so in some instances, some evidence is admissible if the police thought that they had a valid warrant. So, and this is kind of hard to come up with an example because, I mean, when do police think that they have a valid warrant when in fact that they don't? Uh, I'm sure that happens, but I really can't come up with an example for that. But it says, since the purpose is to prevent police, excuse me, misconduct, and in this situation, there is no misconduct, the courts have permitted this evidence into trial. So, again, it's up to the judge's discretion of whether or not he or she wants to ensure that that evidence is either admissible or inadmissible. Admissible meaning that that, that, uh, that evidence should be used in the courtroom or inadmissible meaning that that evidence should not be used in the courtroom. Now there's that inevitable discovery piece like I talked about. So evidence illegally seized may be introduced if it would have been discovered anyways in the course of continuing investigation. Uh, ultimately, it is the judge's discretion again to determine what is and what is not admissible. So that's a little bit more about the Fourth Amendment. We'll get into some of the other um, amendments that we've been talking about. But um, uh, so that's it for today, guys. Uh, we'll get cranking with this a little bit later. Uh, we'll finish up this civil, civil liberties uh, lecture. Let me know if you have any questions, and I will uh, see you guys in class.